Uh, we're kind of wrapping this up now with our study. We got just a few weeks left. Uh, Beverly has some things she wants to share with you this morning on parenting. And uh, I can't imagine anyone who can do that better because she, I got to witness her raising three incredible kids. So, uh, wait. Well, I got to witness. Yeah. I got to go along for the ride. So, uh, what you got? Okay, well, just trying to kind of sum things up and um, get us on the right page. I've got several different topics I want us to finish. Um, one, I found this uh, definition of parenting that I love. I want to say something else. And I don't usually start that class by crying. I am, I am more convicted today than ever that the power of darkness wants to um, trip us up in parenting. He wants to mess with us and play with us and get us insecure about what we do, make us question ourselves about what we do, so that we won't give our children our very best because I'm not my very best when I go into my secure self. You? And I absolutely loved and treasured. If you weren't here Wednesday night, you need to listen to the sermon that uh, Chris Seedman brought us. It was on self-compassion. And I believe that self-compassion is a huge thread and a huge loop in the parenting model that we need to address that we need to spend time praying about, that we will be gentle with ourselves about our own mistakes in parenting. I've been out of the active parenting mode for my youngest child just turned 36. And so I've been out of the active parenting mode for what would you think, 18 years, he's been married almost 15. Uh, it's a different role totally doing adult children than it is children in my home. And I can still wake up in the middle of the night and going, I did what? I said, what? What was I thinking? Why did I do that? What, what's up? I mean, I'm a three on the Enneagram, which means most of the time I'm in the mode of here I am to save the day. That's my normal mode. But I can also go to a four wing, which means, oh, I was such a mess. I mean, you know, I can go in there if I'm not in my strong threeness. And the power of darkness messes with me with that sometimes. Chris Seidman said this Wednesday night. Why would you continue to suffer for your own sins when they've already been suffered for by the one that matters? Mm -hmm. Capital O. And I was like, whoa. Why? Why would we do that in marriage? Why would we go into our weak spot? Why would we stay in our weak spot in parenting? And so I've got this week and we've got next week that, that we want to talk about some parenting things. And I love, I would love, 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 love if we tied a bow on it. But it's just not ever that neat. We're just going to leave a lot of dangling threads and dangling cords and we're going to scratch our heads a little more. And if we came back in a year or two, it may look totally different with things that, that we've learned and things that we said and things, places where you are that, that you want us to uh, dialogue about. But I love the idea of being gentle with us and knowing we're showing up. We're doing our very best. We are busting tail to be brave. And my definition of brave, I've told you this before, but my definition of brave is the spirit at work inside of me. On my own, I'm just a scared little girl. But when the spirit gets a hold of us, you already won. You already won. And we can't let the power of darkness, his lies, and I'm the kind of girl that if, if I believe his lie once, he, he can go on and mess with somebody else. 
I, I can't continue to believe it all by myself. He doesn't have to keep saying it to me. Are you with me with that? Does that make sense? And so we show up and, and we walk it and, and we keep figuring it out, how we can be brave. So this definition I've read to you before, we're starting to tie the bow with loose threads, <laughs> a lot of loose threads, is this primary goal of parenting is not to control our children. Yes, I wanted to, but it's not to control our children. They're not going to be little robots of you. How many of you have already figured that one out? You know what I mean? I mean, they're probably, what, three months old, and you're like, I wanted you to do this differently. But here we are. Primary goal in parenting is not to control our children, but rather to help our children become responsible individuals who can regulate their own behaviors and who have a healthy respect for rules and authority. I scratch my head because I have to have a healthy respect for rules and authority for them. This morning, Rick was going to take his own truck, and he's like, please don't be late. And I said, I'm so glad you said please, because I would so be late. If you, I mean, you know, we were joking about it, but I have this, we were joking, we were joking. But I had this thing of, don't tell me what to do. I mean, you know, it's just kind of funny between us. Have a healthy respect for rules and authority, yes. We also want our children, our children are going to grow up to be followers of the Lord when they feel powerful. For this is essential. They've got to know how to self-regulate if we want them to become responsible, self-reliant, confident individualist, confident individuals, and make it easy for our children to receive his love and his gifts now, one of the lists I went over with you a few weeks ago are some of the myths of discipline. A myth that he or she needs to understand, and that is false. Your children are going to use that as a trump card over you. I just don't understand. And sometimes you just have to go, I don't care if you do or if you don't. This is the way it's going to be. This is, this is the box for our home. This is what Rosses do. This is what people in our home who follow the way of Jesus do. We use that language a lot from the time they are first beginning to be disciplined. We're Jesus followers. We follow hard after him. Need to understand. That's a myth. Number two, we don't want to hurt their self-esteem. That is a myth. We want them to have self-compassion. But my children's self-esteem is not my goal. Their self-esteem is feeling like they did a great job. You're not going to build self-esteem when they are going through a dark season not doing a good job. That's when you're going to speak in with self-compassion. And that is totally different. And if you don't get that one, if, if you're like, I don't know what you're talking about, then let's talk after class. Let, let's talk some and figure that, that one out. Number three, this one's really important. The myth of if I say it enough, if you repeat the same language enough, it's going to become like this to your children. And I hear this from children. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> if you say it too many times, they don't listen anymore. Are you with me with that? So we teach people how to treat us. Sometimes I have moms or dads come to me and go, they don't even listen until I yell. And I'm like, because you've trained them not to listen until you yell. I knew when my daddy woke me up in the morning, I knew I had three times with him waking me up before his voice changed. I knew that. I never got up the first time. And if I laid there long enough, he would come in and scratch my back. So at the second time he started waking, I always flipped over. Wherever I was laying, I flipped over because I knew, he, I knew the pattern. If you want children to obey you the first time, and if you're tired of saying it, train them to do that. And you do not have to give warning. Bum, I said it. I wanted you to listen. So I tip, this is just me, okay, if you want to talk about this after class, it's great. I typically wait till they're in their middle of, it. when I raised children, it was their favorite television show. For you, it might be their favorite game, and just go, oh, bum, I always said it with great empathy. <laughs> I asked you to, da, 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 and you weren't listening. TV off, can we record it? Mm, no, I need you to listen. When I say this, you do this. Do you understand what I'm saying? It, I'm not mad about it. I'm not angry about it. But it is a myth that you have to keep saying it to get them to understand that that's not true. Number four, 
is they can't get a consequence unless they know it's coming. Consequences must be immediate. That is not true. It does not need to be immediate. We talked about this one at length. It can definitely be, I have no clue what I'm going to do about that. Never, ever, ever say, have no clue what I'm going to do with you. That's not true. I know exactly what I'm going to do with you. I don't know what I'm going to do about this. I'm raising you in the way of Jesus. There is always hope. That is hopeless language. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. It's, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. I'm going to talk to dad. It may be tomorrow before I get back with you, but don't worry. You tell a child not to worry, and <laughs> what are they going to do? I mean, it's going to be, I, I can't even wonder. I wonder what dad's going to do. We did that with our teenagers some, and it flips them out, and it's a good, it's a good thing to, to use. I don't know what I'm going to do. Number five is really, really hard, but it is a myth. I have to avoid a meltdown at all costs. That is not true. Number six goes along with that one, and it's this one, but I don't have time. The most pushback I ever got on that one was when I used to teach um, parenting workshops in Highland Park in Dallas. It is the end of Dallas. There's not a lot of uh, stay-at-home moms. Everybody is high career. Everybody is high professional. Children are on their own a lot. And I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that as a blanket. I'm saying that this, this was who came to our parenting workshop. Parenting takes time. It is an investment. We spend a lot of time. And so I'm not going, you're not going to hold me hostage. You are not going to hold me in fear of your creepy meltdowns. You might scream. We may walk out of Walmart and go to the car, but we're either go back in or you will wish we did. Or track in with me. You know what I mean? I mean, we're talking about this, but your meltdowns are not going to hold me hostage. The other day we were at, uh, oh, I don't even remember where it was. We went to Steel City Pops down in Fort Worth. It's a new shopping center. Lovely. But there was a mother sitting on a curb while a four-year-old little girl laid there, screamed and kicked and hit, and she was there for at least 20 minutes. It, it was cool. My heart bled for that mother. But I was so proud of her for just sitting there. She was waiting it out. There was probably a diagnosis for the little child. It was that significant of a fit. But there were times in my life I looked like there might be a diagnosis too. You know what I mean? I mean, it was a pretty big fit. And so we just, we just show up. Our kids? I thought it was you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm kidding. <laughs> More than once. <laughs> just kidding. But, but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there was one of them that threw some pretty big fits. But I don't. Remember that time you sat on the curb while I had 20 minutes? <laughs> Okay, give me feedback. Are we together with all of that so, so far? Okay, now, now let's go on to the other one. This was a list I started right before we left for vacation and sabbatical. Number one, we talked about at length, and it's keep them safe physically. That is your role. We're out of miss now. Your, your role in parenting is to keep them safe. Our kids, and when I say kids, I'm really talking about anybody in, in your home. This is all the way up. We keep them safe physically. There will be, there are reasons, and we, I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that we live in a government that is based on Christianity or based on the way of Jesus or based even on good health, but there is a reason that the drinking age is 21, and is because it, it messes with, with brain. It significantly, significantly can harm our children. Keeping them safe physically sets a boundary around alcohol. I will not allow that. That is not happening on my watch. There is, a, there is a boundary around vaping. You check it out. You check what your kids are doing. You check out who they're talking to on social media. You have all the passwords. Snapchat drives me crazy because you can't check that as much. That is tough. But I think ra random checks are just great. We're going to figure it out because our job is to keep them safe Physically, we do a lot of teaching around that. We do a lot of talking around that. And it's still a dance. N number two is we model. And you're going to see that the next few are more about you than about them. But we model 
how a Christ follower handles emotion. There is not an emotion that is wrong or an emotion that's bad. They're all over the place. But we handle, we teach them. This is how somebody with the dust of Jesus on their feet handles out emotion. This is what we do when we get angry. This is what we think about. This is, I I need to be quiet for a minute. I'm feeling angry and I need to stop. We model that for them. We talk about that. We model sadness. We model confusion. We model fear. We model how to help in fear. We model to children, and this is such an important time with school getting back in session, we model how to act when they feel like an outsider. We talk to them about being an outsider, if that's the deal. We talk to them about when they don't get the starting role of a sport or a dance team or they don't make the cheerleading. We model. We talk about that. We think of a time that we didn't get something. We're empathetic with that. We model. There are times, particularly with emotion, and I'm so in the middle of this right now with Malaya, but there are times you absolutely cannot fix it. You cannot make them feel better. All you can do is journey beside them while they're in the middle of it. You will not be alone. I'm going to lay with you. I remember one night, and I didn't even remember that that Jenny would know this, but her um, probably a long-time boyfriend had broke up with her, long time. She was a sophomore, so probably three months, you know. But uh, she came in, and she said, I don't think I'm going to be able to sleep. She had a twin bed, but she had a trundle. And I just went in and pulled the trundle out, and I slept with her that night. And then right before she died, she wrote this blog about how she felt the presence of the Lord because her mom was near. Because I showed up. I didn't know what to do. I just did what I knew to do. Casey, my oldest daughter-in-law, her dad did not grow up really with a father figure at all. And his mom made a lot of huge mistakes. He became a believer after he met Casey's mom. Um... And he remembers when Casey had a big breakup. He said, I didn't know what to do, so I just put her in the car and we drove. And I said, I'm just here with you. If you want to talk, you can talk. But he said this at the rehearsal dinner. He's like, I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to be with her. But that is something that parents need to understand is sometimes with our children, we cannot make the pain stop. There's nothing we say magically to make it better. We just remind them of the presence of the Lord. I want to remind you that this is really a thing. You spend your time and energy preparing the child for the road, not the road for the child. They're going to get some teachers they don't like. Now, if it's somebody harmful, I can take care of that. But if it's somebody they need to sit with and they need to figure it out and they need to learn how to ask questions, they need to figure that out. But my time, my energy is spent on preparing that child. What do you need to say tomorrow? Who do you need to talk to tomorrow? What's the question? You need to show up early. You need to say you don't understand. If you missed an assignment and she said don't don't do it, you still need to turn it in. You need to show her that you are a person of character and you're going to do what you said you were going to do. Even if you still get a zero, it's okay. You show up, you do it because we're honest in our home. This is the way Rosses are. This is the way Christ followers are. That's the language we use. Number three is you help them to walk in compassion with others. Now, this is all stuff you've got to own yourself. But there is some stuff going on right now on the news that gives us a lot of opportunities to practice this. If in your home you use the language of us and them, I am begging you today to repent of that. Because in the world, in our humanity, we are more alike than we are different. And it doesn't need to be language of us and them. It needs to be language where we're compassionate with other people. And I wonder what it feels like to be her. Or I wonder what it feels like to be him. We ask some questions. I know they were really rude to you. But they're rude to you because they're in so much pain themselves. 
They may be toxic. I'm not saying be best friends, and I'm sure not saying invite them over to play so your child can be treated rudely. I'm saying to develop compassion for other people. Give me feedback if that makes sense, because I can say more about that. If, okay, we got that one. Number four. So we've got keeping them safe physically, model how a Christ follower handles emotions. And I want you to notice my, my language. I just want to point this out. On, on this, in this stuff, I'm not using the word Christian much because what I've learned from Rick's study of post-millennials, a lot of people claim, hang with me through this, but a lot of people claim to be Christians that don't follow the way of Jesus. And so I like the language of I'm a Christ follower. I feel like that says more about who I am than to say I'm a Christian. Can Does, I throw something in right Please there? do. It's interesting in our own history in the restoration movement, Alexander Campbell did not want to call his group Christians. He wanted to call them disciples. And I think that's an important thing. And Dallas Willard has written some excellent stuff on this, that in the Western world, we have so watered down what a Christian is. Even in churches of Christ, we've done that. We think if I can just get them dumped, then they're a Christian. Dallas Willard would argue, unless you are a disciple of Jesus Christ who is pursuing Him, who is trying to become everything He is, you're not a Christian. It's about discipleship. It is about us choosing to follow somebody and become like Him. It's not about showing up at church occasionally. It's about being a pursuer of Jesus Christ. So I just wanted to... That's fresh on my mind because I'm reading Dallas Willard right now. Uh, but you know, I just think that's interesting even in our own history. And so you've heard of the disciples of Christ? That was originally what Alexander Campbell wanted to call his churches. Disciples of Christ. Anyway, go ahead. I love that. Thank you for saying that. That's good. Thank you. <clears throat> and again, just like I said with this class... It means there's going to be a lot of dangling threads. With, I said this yesterday, but I've prayed about this, and I'm saying this today because I'm following hard after Jesus. And it means that we're committed and we're intentional about following Him and making changes in our lives. We hold up a spiritual mirror a lot and investigate that of what, what needs to stop. What do I need to start? And our children get to bear witness to that. So number four, going right into there. You know what? I've got something written on this compassion piece I, I want to read. It says, knowing our darkness well enough that we can sit in the dark with another. We do not have a relationship. And I wrote this while I was in grief. We do not have a relationship between the healed and the wounded but we share relationship between people that are e equals. All of us are wounded. There is not a wounded and a done with it. I wish so much for to be healed, but I will spend the rest of my days while my feet walk on dirt in he healing, but it will never be finished until I see the face of Jesus face to face, until I see him, until I touch him. At that point, we are healed. But until then, we're continuing to walk out as scarred humanity. Mm -hmm. Number four is that we will guide them spiritually. Talked about this at length. We will set those children up for success. On your index cards that you wrote questions, and we have, I refresh those, I read those probably every week, every other week, going over, making sure we're incorporating. I'm fully aware we've still left out one in, in laws, but I'm, I'm still going to touch on it. <laughs> it's important to me as, as a mother in law. But one of the things there is how do we make new friends? How do we handle friends? And I believe if you sit in this room and you have children or you are pursuing having children, you need to have other Christ followers that are at your table as friends because it takes a tribe of people. It's not just your voice. 
You want other people speaking into your children. When there's a problem, you want your children to know who else they can call. You, you want your children to know these people follow after Jesus. If you need anything, there are people who will agree to invest in your children. That is why this time of year, I go into manic mode praying over those of you that are believers, that follow the way of Jesus, and you teach school. You have got a rich opportunity to speak hope, to speak life, and to children, to give them hope for their future, because they may not have any other voice. I know children in our schools, in our area schools, that don't have any other voices of hope. We work with them. And if they have one of you, oh, that just is breath to me. It's breath to them. It's breath for their children. And it's also breath to you. It just feels good to do that. So I want, I want you to do that. We, we model prayer for our children. We value the word with our children. We show a value to church with our children. Our children see us make sacrifices to be here. Our children see us say, we're going back early because we got people to be with tomorrow morning. It matters where, where you sit. It matters who you sit by. It matters the language you use when you get in your car to go home about what you talk about with church. I've heard of homes, I'm so grateful I didn't grow up in one, that when they get in the car after church, they critique everything that happened because, I want to say this with all respect, okay? This is all respect. But we call it the auditorium. What do you do in an auditorium? You audit what just happened. So let's start at the very beginning. How did you like the opening? Well, not so much. How did you like that song? Love the song, little slow. Love the song, little... I mean, we're into critiquing mode. No, if you want your children to value being here, it was great to be here. I love this conversation after church. I mean, there are some Sundays you've got to go for a stretch on what you like. <laughs> but we like this. We love this. We Always like this. The Always the sermon. <laughs> Always the sermon. <clears throat> are, are you with me? Are we together with that? We show value to church. We lean in hard to what we like with that. It, it becomes power. And we give opportunities uh, for our children to talk about it and practice the word. One of my, well, both my daughters-in-law, I guess my sons too, but I just picture my daughters-in-law doing it, had this big chalkboard. One is they're going out in, into the garage and one at their kitchen, and there's always the verse there. And sometimes my grandkids are getting old enough now that they pick the memory verse. What verse do you want to memorize? Now, when my kids are little or when those kids are, they, it's just three words or it's just starting. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. My kids learned that one early. My, my grands learned that one early. And now we've gone on, and now we learn the rest. But we teach our children to value the word of God. Wait, wait, wait. I can tell we're starting to get upset. Let's remember. Let's remember. We go back and, and we, hit, we hit a touch point again, as we've talked about. Number five is we give them a safe place. Oh, I love this one. I love this one. We give them a safe place to land and to rise up when they fall. The language frequently of the adults in our world becomes very hopeless when we mess up. There is no hope for rising. You've got to figure it out. And I believe that as believers, um, let me say it like this. That's what Jesus does for us. He gives us a safe place to land. He covers us with grace and mercy. He's already suffered for everything we already did that was wrong. He is preparing a room for us in his house. We are going to be known someday like he knows us. I mean, we're going to know him like he knows us. We've got a rich future. And so we give them a safe place to land and rise up. Sometimes my language would be, it's going to be interesting to see what you do here. How are you going to get back up? What verse is going to be important? Who do you need to apologize to? Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive so you don't have to carry this weight around? 
How can I help? Is there a Bible story this reminds you of? Let's think through some stories that, that we know. Is there something in this story that would help you or bless you? Do you believe the Lord sees you, that he's with you? Go back to the Hagar story. For the Lord is revealed, is El-Rohi, the God who sees it all. Go back through with Abraham and Isaac where God reveals himself, Yahweh Jireh, the Lord who provides. Just when you don't think it's going to happen, God shows up. He does something. It may not be that you don't have pain anymore, but he still shows up and gives you what you need to walk out the road you've been called to walk. Give them a safe place. Teach them about forgiveness. And teach them that you absolutely cannot let a moment of your life You can't let a moment of your story define your history. You're not the one who. There's commas. The Lord is continuing to work. We've got to teach our children about life's commas, not about periods with this is over, this is done, have no clue how the Lord's going to use this. Sometimes I say I have no clue how the Lord's going to do this, but I'm praying the eyes of our heart are fully opened that we pay attention to how he's going to use this in the days to come. I'm curious what he's going to do with this. I'm glad I have a front row seat to watch what he's going to do with this in your life. You be looking for him. He's going to use this. Give our children a safe place to land and rise up when they fall. Teach them about forgiveness because you forgive them. You know, when I taught first grade, this was parent night. I always did this little piece. It sounds so simple, and it was. You know, I did the color chart. Every kid had a clothespin. I don't know what y'all do. But every kid had a clothespin, and there was like green, yellow, orange, and then red. I mean, you're going to the principal. You know, I mean, and I didn't do red very often. Because, well, this is just my philosophy is once you get them to the principal, you don't have any control over what's going to happen in there. And I wanted full control over what was going to happen. <laughs> and so I didn't do that very often. But I told my parents, every morning, every child will start on green in here. I will let you know if I need your help with di- discipline. If not, it means I took care of it. If you don't get a note, it means I took care of it. And we're done. Because every morning, I believe, and I did say this at parent night, that God's mercies are new. And so I'm still not going to be mad at your kid. They may have a consequence. From, I mean, like their chair may, may be moved, but I didn't move chairs a lot. Because my second day of first grade, you're not even going to believe this. I walked in the room and I said, Miss Landers, where's my chair? And she said, oh, Bevy, that's what they called me then. Oh, Bevy, your chair is over by the windows because you talked all day yesterday. And I was like, by the window. Can y'all believe that? I had to sit all by myself the second day of first grade. It was horrible for me. It was like this torture. But anyway. (laughs) And that still would be. It's still with me. Miss Landers became a Christian after that, so I did forgive her after that. But it was hard. It was hard. (laughs) Forgiveness. We've got to model, teach them about forgiveness. Teach them when they bring something up that they did. We go, I don't even know what you're talking about. Because I have the eyes of the Lord over you, and I don't even remember what you're talking about. We're all fresh here. We're, We're good. Now, again, forgiveness does not mean no consequences. Number six is we offer hope for the future. We do a lot of future talk with them. We let them hold space a lot um, about their future. This last week, there was a very popular author, a Nobel Peace Prize, I think, Toni Morrison. She, Nobel, am I saying that right? I don't remember if she won that or not. She won the Pulitzer Prize. Well, that's probably it. That's probably it. But she has this quote that I absolutely love. And we're going to use this this morning at, as we close for children, the ones that live in our home the children in our classrooms, and uh, our own spouses, our people. When she said this, when a child walks in the room, let your eyes light up. Mm. Always be happy to see your people. Nothing makes me feel better when I haven't, well, I guess at the end of a day, even with you. When I walk in a room and somebody goes, hey, and they're happy to see me. They stop cooking or whatever that they're doing and, and they notice me. 
You know, I don't tell this story very often, but after Jenny died, Malaya went to a new school. She followed one of her teachers. It was her, uh, she went from fourth to fifth. Fourth grade was self-contained, and so she went with that teacher to a new school. We rounded the corner to pick Malaya up the first day of school, and y'all, when we rounded the corner, I'm still probably four cars from her, I could see her chin quivering. And we got her, and Jenny was a permanent sub, had always been at the school with, with Malaya, always. So you just picture in your mind how favored Malaya was because of Jenny's behavior. We got her in the car and Malaya said, not one teacher even had eye contact with me today. So I made a few calls that night. I didn't know many people in Keller, but I knew just a few because I thought, that's not happening again. Somebody needs to be looking. And I just wondered, it's not just Malaya. You just got to notice your kids. I mean, I've been a teacher too. I know it's hard. It's hard to look at every kid when you're rotating classes. That's a lot of kids. Eye contact, how long does that take? To notice them, to see them, and let your eyes light up? I know I get it's stressed. But we got to switch those priorities around a bit so that the top priority is that every child who is in your presence sees the eyes of Jesus. That every child who is with you knows they've been with somebody, cares about them, and sees them. So, do your eyes light up when your husband walks in? Do your eyes light up when your children walk in? You know, this last week I got to speak at the middle school when I ended with this. Fear and hatred are very contagious, and we see that in our country right mm. now. But they are not as contagious as love and brave hearts. Love and brave hearts, wherever our feet walk on dirt, love and bra brave hearts need to win. With us, that's what we catch. With us, that's what we breathe in. With us, that's what we choose to breathe out. We know him, we know the one who infuses us, and may we notice and may we see the children in our world. So, next week is my last time to be here. Are you going to do the next week by yourself? I need to talk to okay. the big boys over there. Um, next week we will cover in-laws. <coughs> it will not take the whole time. Has the second bell already rang? I don't think so. Does anybody have anything that you were hoping we would cover that we haven't? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I want to write that down. I want to cover that next time because I do think that that's a dance. Yeah, yeah. And so we will, I will write that down. Okay, thank you. That's a great question too. What else? Okay, let's close. Let's pray. Father, what great words today. And... Uh, I'm praying that you will use them to bless these friends of ours, this, this uh, part of our church family, as they raise the next generation. Yes, Lord. Oh, Father, may they raise them to be disciples, to seek Jesus with all their hearts. And we're grateful for this opportunity. We're grateful for this day. And we ask your blessing over it all. Lord, we know that you have uh, provided church for a number of reasons but one of them is so that we can bring honor to you and that's certainly what we want to do but it's also so that we can encourage each other and so i i pray that what happens here today will be a form of encouragement to all of us and we pray this in jesus name amen amen